Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's securityboulevard.com webinar, brought to you by TechStrong and Hisolate. My name is Cody J. Brown, and I'll be moderating today's session. We have an exciting presentation ahead, but before we begin, I have just a few housekeeping notes. First, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the discussion, it will be made available to rewatch. You'll receive an email after the webinar concludes with a link to access the on-demand. We also want to hear from you, so please send in your questions at any time throughout the program by using the Q&A feature. We'll try to address as many questions as you can send in, so be sure to send them in early. I also want to direct your attention to two polls that are already open in the Polls tab. Please navigate to the Poll tab and give us your feedback as soon as possible. And I'll also direct your attention to the Chat tab. Here is where we just want you to talk to us and talk to each other. Let us know your thoughts, say a quick hello, or just tell us from where you're tuning in. And finally, at the end of today's webinar, we will have a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. Stick around to see if you're one of our four lucky winners today. Let's go ahead and kick off our webinar. Our topic is securing access to sensitive corporate data and applications in the hybrid world. And I'm joined today by Tal Zamir, founder, CTO, and board member at Hisolate. Tal is a 20-year software industry leader with a track record of solving urgent business challenges by reimagining how technology works. An entrepreneur at heart, he has pioneered multiple breakthrough cybersecurity and virtualization products. Before founding Hisolate, Tal incubated next-gen end-user computing products in the CTO office at VMware. Earlier, he was part of the leadership team at Winova, a desktop virtualization startup acquired by VMware. Tal began his career in an elite IDF technology unit, leading mission-critical cybersecurity projects that won the prestigious Israeli Defense Award. He holds multiple U.S. patents, as well as an MSc degree in computer science and the honor of valedictorian from the Technion. It is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Tal to kick us off. Tal, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks, Cody, for the introduction, and thanks for having us here. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, before we get started, um, I'd like to go through what's in it for you and what's the agenda that we're going to cover today. Uh, and I'd love for this to be interactive as possible. So please do have a look at the polls tab and, and chat away. Uh, so on the agenda first, I'm going to cover why we think uh, endpoints today are becoming more and more risky, especially in the work from home era, uh, hybrid work era, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we're going to cover uh, the threats and uh, how you can mitigate them. We're going to go through a bunch of approaches that enterprises uh, take to secure sensitive data and apps uh, on endpoints, and then uh, present uh, an alternative approach uh, by Hisolate to isolate sensitive apps and data in a comprehensive and elegant way on your endpoints. Um, we're going to show a, a quick demo of that as well. So stay tuned. Um, and let's get started. So. It goes without saying, but today, um, some of the most sensitive data uh, that an enterprise has um, is resident and stored on endpoints and gets access to uh, from your endpoints. And there's a bunch of that sensitive data, uh, more than uh, uh, we can probably imagine. Uh, it includes privileged IT uh, systems um, or access to production systems, uh, be it by IT staff or by developers or DevOps teams. Uh, it could be databases and business intelligence systems with client data that uh, endpoints have access to. Uh, it could be employee HR data, uh, healthcare data, uh, financial data, um, and potentially even high-value transactions that some of your employees are performing from their endpoints. Uh, needless to say, sensitive documents um, and sensitive source code, uh, and even third-party networks that are being accessed via VPN. And all of these uh, could be, in your case, uh, crown jewels of super sensitive data that you really want to protect. Uh, so that's obvious, uh, obviously a problem we all need to face uh, and find a way to protect. Uh, but the flip side of this is that endpoints are becoming more and more out of control, and especially in the hybrid work era. Um, there's mixed usage of personal and corporate apps, especially as people are working from home. And uh, they might check their email or do instant messaging uh, for personal needs. And this is a, a serious attack vector for malware. Uh, they might need to install a variety of uh, new applications, um, collaboration tools like Zoom or Teams or Slack or 
Dropbox, uh, to collaborate with their peers, yeah, especially when working remotely. And to add to that, when working from home, you have fewer security controls uh, as you're not inside the corporate network unless you're always on VPN. And then um, you don't have the traditional network security controls that uh, you've built uh, and are pres present on-prem, uh, like your intrusion detection systems, your proxies, and so on. And add to that that uh, those endpoints are outside of your parameter. And if they're depending on some on-prem update servers uh, to be up to date, uh, and they are not always on VPN, they won't get that uh, software updates uh, for Windows or for other software that you have running on the endpoint. And finally, more and more users, especially developers and uh, knowledge workers, are demanding local admin rights uh, to be able to do their jobs. And this introduces additional uh, attack vectors and then ways for malware to uh, do more harm on the endpoint. So these two uh, sides of the coin of endpoints out of control, and on the other hand, um, having access to privileged and uh, sensitive systems is a real uh, a big deal. And just looking um, at the poll, if uh, anyone who didn't respond can uh, spend a few uh, seconds to kind of answer at least uh, the first question on how uh, are you concerned uh, with any of those uh, endpoint risks? I would love to hear your opinion. Um, I see that uh, at least uh, for now, uh, many of you think that uh, endpoints are being used for personal risky activities. That's something that we also see out there with our customers uh, and other surveys we've done in the past. That's a serious uh, problem, emerging problem with the hybrid work era. Um, and um, also, it seems like a lot of you are talking about um, missing patches uh, and security controls uh, for remote endpoints. So I'll give you a few, uh, another minute to answer this, and uh, we'll uh, continue in a sec. For anyone who's looking for this, it's under the Pulse tab um, on the platform here. We'll give it a few more seconds uh, if anyone else wants to cast their vote and share uh, what are your concerns. Right, so definitely uh, I'll keep this up in case uh, other folks join in later and to see the final results uh, as we end this, but definitely the use of per, uh, endpoints for personal uh, use, uh, risk use is a top concern for many of you and makes sense, um, especially today. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the mix of the two, uh, of having uh, access to those risky applications on the endpoint, and on the other hand, access to privileged specific systems and data is a big deal, because now malware has a variety of ways to get in and infect an endpoint and on and accelerate the data through a variety of channels. And not just malware, also insiders, uh, your malicious insiders can use the same uh, exfiltration channels to leak data out uh, and do harm. And the types of action that uh, malicious actors can do on the endpoint range from exfiltrating the local documents stored on the endpoint, uh, accessing remote data and uh, taking it out, um, stealing credentials, account take takeover, uh, access tokens that they can uh, exfiltrate and then log in from another device, take screenshots of keystroke uh, logging, um, accessing your critical systems and doing harm. So all of this is, of course, uh, actions that we see in the wild by malware uh, trying to do harm. And moving from this to some of the common approaches to secure sensitive apps and data. So uh, there's a variety of ways to try to kind of uh, protect the sensitive data that is present on the endpoint. And we go through a few of them and uh, kind of uh, talk about the pros and cons of each. So if you're considering uh, further securing your endpoints and securing the sensitive data in your endpoint, this might help you uh, see the pitfalls that other enterprises are bumping into. So uh, the report is going to examine our endpoint security agents, uh, the, the traditional or next-gen antiviruses or EPP, EDR, XDR, whatever you want to call it, uh, which is a common practice. Um, endpoint hardening and restrictions uh, that limit uh, what you can do on the endpoint is another common approach. Um, endpoint data loss prevention uh, tools that try to protect some types of data on the endpoint. Uh, cloud access security brokers to protect uh, cloud apps and uh, acceleration of data through that. 
Um, and VDI or desktop as a service as another way to put sensitive data in some kind of jail. So that's another uh, way to protect sensitive data access from endpoints. So as I go through this, I'd love to get your uh, votes on the second question of what you do to secure sensitive data on your endpoints. Uh, you don't need to name any vendors, just uh, cast your vote just so we know uh, here what are the top uh, ways enterprises look at uh, protecting this data. Um, great, so let's go one by one quickly on those top approaches. Um, first one is endpoint security agents, um, be it EPP, EDR, uh, next gen antivirus. So we can't live without these. This is part of the compliance requirements today on endpoints. And it can definitely stop some known uh, bad or explicitly malicious activities. Um, that's great and definitely some good hygiene that everybody should have. However, uh, in a recent survey of ransomware victims, 75% uh, of them actually reported to have up-to-date modern EPP EDR solutions. So uh, apparently it doesn't help to solve the problem of exfiltrating sensitive data from endpoints. And when you come to think of it, it makes sense because by the end of the day, uh, I can't blame the EPP EDR vendors or security agent vendors. Uh, malware, um, specifically ransomware, but any type of malware, can just act legitimately. And it's really almost an impossible task for those types of solutions to determine what is uh, benign and what is uh, malicious. Uh, imagine a piece of malware that acts like uh, a backup application uh, and starts uh, backing up your data to the cloud. Uh, how can you tell if it's a legitimate piece of software or malware ransomware that uh, exfiltrates your data for extortion? It's really tough to tell. Or whether a, a certain application is a uh, um, Zoom application for uh, conferencing that can share your screen and let the other party control your endpoint, or whether it's a remote access Trojan that actually does this for malicious purposes. So it's really tough to tell. Um, and furthermore, the bad guys uh, leverage zero-day uh, vulnerabilities to um, find ways to escalate and get high-privilege code execution in the operating system. Uh, they look for zero days in the browser, in any kind of modern uh, popular application. And once they leverage that, uh, it could be the end of the story and they fully own your endpoint. Um, add to that that they can quickly evolve because they actually can test their malware against uh, the latest endpoint protection agents. Um, you know, they have access to the same tools that you have and they can, before they launch their attack, just test that uh, security tools with their malware and evolve it to evade uh, the, their detection. So it's really tough for endpoint security agents to fix this problem of uh, sensitive data exfiltration of the endpoint. Um, another um, common approach is hardening the endpoint, kind of uh, putting controls in place to prevent users from doing all kinds of risky uh, actions, like uh, blocking certain risky websites, uh, blocking the installation of applications, uh, blocking uh, USB thumb drives, uh, so that the attack vector is reduced and there's fewer ways to get malware in or to exfiltrate data out. Um, you can even go to do upright listing to only allow certain types of uh, applications. However, this is not very practical in the real world because um, by the end of the day, it's hard to close all of the gaps you have in a modern operating system. Uh, Windows has 40 million lines of code. Uh, it's 14 years old. It's really tough to close all of the different functionalities that it offers as an operating system, not to mention all the apps you have there. Uh, and all of those different functionalities you have in the operating system can lead to compromise or to exfiltration of data. Um, so it's a challenging task to close all of those gaps with hardening. And even if you do, uh, users are not gonna like it because you're limiting what they can do at the endpoint. Uh, they can't visit the websites they need for their work. They can't install the modern collaboration tools that they need uh, to do business. So it's not gonna fly in most cases for knowledge workers. And if they do, uh, uh, if you do have that with knowledge workers, you're gonna get into this game of exception handling and uh, introducing a lot of IT overhead in allowing certain types of actions. And this is a lot of help desk work for you. Um, and finally, even if you've done all that and you convince the user and you do this exception handling, attackers can find ways to use legitimate apps and legitimate websites to do harm, uh, leveraging signed software and uh, known good websites to do exfiltration of data. Um, another approach is endpoint DLP, uh, data leak prevention or data loss prevention, 
where basically uh, these types of endpoint software blocks users for mistakenly or intentionally uh, sharing protected data uh, with external third parties uh, or publicly. However, this only works with a limited set of apps, um, for example, Word or Office documents, um, and maybe a few other apps, um, and not all of the ecosystem of applications supports these kinds of solutions. Think about Slack or other modern SaaS apps that don't play the DLP game. Um, and it cannot really, um, even if it works for the specific app that it does work with, cannot really protect against malware that got into your operating system and can tamper with these controls or disable them. Um, add to that that you need um, either the users or the uh, DLP engines to classify content as sensitive or non-sensitive, which is a hard task. And sometimes uh, the malicious insiders might actually intentionally uh, misclassify the content as uh, public while it's really confidential. Uh, so there's ways to trick these engines and they're not far, far from being perfect in stopping sensitive data from leaking out. Um, they can also trigger uh, compatibility issues with a bunch of applications where the normal workflow for user or the normal uh, features that you would want to use uh, do not work as expected out of the box with these solutions. Uh, so while it's, uh, it has good intentions, it has limited scope uh, to do a DLP on the endpoint. Um, other um, more modern approach is uh, CASB or Cloud Access Security Broker, where basically uh, you have a cloud service uh, sitting in your web proxy or connected to your web proxy where uh, it has visibility over uh, what the users are doing um, and can do detection on uh, anomalies uh, when users share data with a third party or when users download uh, lots of data. Um, so visibility and user anomaly detection for cloud apps and to prevent shadow IT. Um, however, those types of solutions um, only work with specific cloud apps. Um, there's a long tail of modern apps and they keep coming and it's really tough for those solutions to, to keep up to speed with the, um, those kind of SaaS um, apps out there, especially with this um, explosion of new tools. Uh, further, it still requires enterprises to classify content as protected or sensitive. So um, it's um, work that you're not always able to do and define all of the rules and keep them up to date. Uh, so a tough challenge for uh, the security team. Uh, and even if you've done that, eventually uh, the users will download some documents, content, which is sensitive to their endpoints and malware on the endpoint can still exfiltrate data because the CASB is not putting itself inside the endpoint. It's only working at the cloud level. So anything happening within the endpoint is out of its scope. Um, and while working from home, this becomes even more complicated uh, where typical CASB uh, solutions, at least the traditional ones, might be on-prem. And again, to take effect, they would need you to be on a VPN connection permanently. So uh, it's gonna be tricky to apply them and you need to move over to some cloud-based solution for this. So that's CASB. Finally, on my list of uh, uh, traditional ways enterprises uh, try to stop data loss of sensitive data um, is putting all of that sensitive data and apps in some uh, VDI, sensitive VDI desktop or sensitive DAS desktop. Uh, basically a remote des virtual desktop sitting somewhere on-prem or in the cloud. And you can enforce that sensitive app access is done only from that remote desktop. Um, while this is definitely uh, putting a jail around the sensitive content, um, it is super expensive and complex to set up and maintain. And especially uh, if you plan to scale this for a large population of employees and sensitive data is eventually spread over uh, many endpoints, it would be very expensive to spin up a VDI desktop per employee for just the sensitive apps that they're accessing on top of the normal desktop that you provision to those employees. So it doesn't scale very well um, for employees that touch sensitive information. Um, and they will also dislike the solution um, unless they have a high bandwidth, low latency connection at all times. The experience over those types of VDI, DAS solutions um, really is degraded once you have a, a worse uh, connection or offline, you don't have any kind of uh, VDI access. Um, to add to all of this, if you're considering a desktop as a service solution, you're actually putting your sensitive data in that DAS desktop 
uh, which is in the cloud in the heads of some third party provider and not on prem on your infrastructure. So you're taking that sensitive data and the most uh, sensitive crown jewels and putting them in the hands of a third party uh, vendor in the cloud. So an another problem for those types of approaches. So, you know, when we look at those approaches, um, we kind of build a checklist of what do we really need to secure access to sensitive corporate apps at scale in an elegant uh, way. Uh, so you want it to support all apps, not just a few selected apps, but any kind of uh, app the user is using, including the modern types of apps. Um, you want it to cover multiple endpoint data leakage channels, not just uh, a few of them. You want to be very comprehensive in the coverage. You want the security to be by design and not depend on heuristics. Um, it needs to be cost effective and scalable to all of your employees if needed, uh, while providing them with a great user experience that doesn't limit users in their day to day work and doesn't require this uh, huge uh, uh, undertaking of data classification and labeling of data. And finally, it needs to protect not just against malware, but also against uh, malicious insiders that try to take this sensitive data out. That's kind of uh, the goal we set to ourselves as we try to build uh, isolate. Uh, and of course, uh, this is how we think we could solve this uh, sensitive app access problem. Um, and just uh, to share with you what isolate is all about. Um, slide, uh, skip to this next slide. Um, so isolate is a local isolated workspace that we're able to spin up on users endpoints uh, in minutes and to manage uh, those isolated workspaces from the cloud. So basically, um, it's kind of a virtual secure zone uh, that we spin up instantly and on which sensitive apps will be exclusively accessed. So uh, think about it this way. You have a, a PC, a corporate PC um, running Windows, for example, that could be compromised. Um, and with Isolate, we deploy a, a lightweight app into your corporate image uh, and isolate uh, on that endpoint instantly spins up this uh, Hyper-V virtual machine uh, running uh, um, a lightweight copy of Windows uh, based on the Windows you already have on that uh, machine. So kind of a lightweight VM running just uh, the trusted binaries from Microsoft um, and a select few apps that you want that environment to have. And then um, this virtual machine is completely isolated from your day-to-day -day, uh, potentially compromised OS and your sensitive apps and data will be exclusively available from that isolated zone and nowhere else. So um, this is our way of kind of putting a, a, a local jail around uh, all of that sensitive apps and data that uh, reside in the endpoint. Um, and the isolation level here um, covers almost any kind of uh, attack factor you could think of, any kind of exfiltration channel, ranging from uh, VM-based isolation, uh, which is the basis for this solution. So uh, the memory space is different. Uh, it's a virtual hard drive. It's a virtual CPU. So it's all separate from your main operating system. As well as protecting things like uh, key logging and screen capture of that virtual machine. So if you try to uh, capture a screen um, of that virtual machine and the sensitive data in it, you won't be able to uh, and as a user or as malware sitting on that machine as well as planting a watermark uh, within the display of the virtual machine so that even if you take a, a photo with your smartphone camera, it will include your identity so you're deterred from leaking that data out. Um, on top of this, we put um, fine-grained clipboard controls to prevent copying and pasting of data freely between the zones, uh, preventing um, thumb drives into this sensitive zone, uh, printing of data, um, it's all fully encrypted um, so that uh, you can remotely wipe the sensitive data if you need to, uh, as well as um, bringing it back to a clean snapshot uh, coming up from a pristine OS uh, image every time we restart this um, VM. Um, this is a hardened VM on top of this so that you don't have admin rights uh, for installing malware in it, even if you found a way to get malware inside this zone. And you can even set up a, a PIN code to unlock access to this virtual machine as an extra authentication step. Like if someone is a family member, uh, tries to use a sensitive app, uh, they cannot do that without providing this additional authentication. Uh, to finish this all up, it's also 
uh, integrated with zero trust solutions, uh, for example, with Azure AD conditional access, so that exclusively you can only access your sensitive apps from that sensitive zone. So this is kind of the security story of Isolate and how it comprehensively protects your sensitive apps and data on the endpoint. Now, um, beyond security, which is the key uh, core element of Isolate, it's uh, different in other ways from just spinning up uh, your uh, virtual machine on your endpoint uh, and using it for sensitive access, which you could try doing. Uh, so the main differentiation between isolated just uh, spinning up a virtual machine on your device is on security, user experience, and manageability. So from the security aspect, we already covered the various security controls we have in place beyond just uh, being a virtual machine. Uh, but there's also a lot of user experience aspects which make this uh, a seamless experience for users. Uh, first, it looks like another desktop space uh, for those of you familiar with multiple spaces on Windows or Mac. So you could just flip between the zones in an easy way. Um, and even if you make a mistake and you try to browse to, for example, a sensitive website uh, on the normal day-to-day -day zone, will automatically redirect you uh, to the correct zone, to the sensitive area. So you're not able to make a mistake and you cannot access it from any other place and vice versa. Um, we make sure that the impact of this VM is negligible by automatically pausing the virtual machine so it doesn't consume any resources but not active while introducing additional optimizations on memory and graphic acceleration so that it really feels native and doesn't consume any resources or overhead for the user. It works offline, locally, doesn't depend on any uh, central uh, resources and any app running on Windows can work as is. That's in terms of the user experience, uh, but also from the manageability aspect, uh, it doesn't require you, as opposed to a normal VM solution, to manage another OS image, to patch it, to maintain it, to build it. Uh, we just use this uh, magic of spinning up a fork of your existing Windows on your corporate endpoint and just uh, the core parts of Windows, which are signed by Microsoft, are loaded into the virtual machine. Uh, this way, uh, you don't need to do this double uh, management and uh, the overhead uh, included. Um, and we automatically patch everything for you, all of the software in it, uh, with a central cloud management console that lets you define all of the policies and all of the standard enterprise manageability aspects that you would expect. So that's kind of uh, an overview of Isolate uh, in Slideware, but I'd love to show you also uh, this in action, how it looks like uh, for the user. So um, I'm going to share my screen. So this is uh, on a Windows 11 uh, machine, but of course it works also for Windows 10 uh, similarly. So what I'm going to show is what happens after you install Isolate and how you use it for sensitive access on a, on a corporate machine. So after you deploy the, the Lightweight Isolate app, uh, you get this guide uh, popping up for you. It takes uh, literally two minutes to install. Um, and this guide will explain that uh, there's a shortcut to switch between the environments. And there's a bunch of ways to flip between your sensitive world and your day-to-day -day world. But for example, you can use this keystroke combination, uh, which I'm using here to flip into my isolate sensitive environment. Uh, you can actually notice here uh, this watermark that we plant on top of the, uh, everything the user is doing in the sensitive world indicating the identity of the user and deterring the user from taking that photo. Um, and we'll go to this VM in a second and show it in detail, but this is how I'm flipping back and forth between the two zones. I can also use this desktop shortcut and a variety of other ways to switch between the zones. Now, um, assuming you want to um, look at the list of programs in the host OS, uh, which is my corporate image, you have a bunch of software in it, um, whatever the user installed, his personal apps, his corporate apps, uh, but the virtual machine is just a clean copy of Windows that was spun up instantly and only contains a bunch of apps that my administrator wanted me to have, like Chrome and Edge and VPN uh, from Pulse in this uh, case. Um, and you can determine what is deployed inside the virtual machine from the isolate management console. Um, so these are the two zones. And of course, uh, now if I'm going to try to browse into something sensitive uh, for my day-to-day -day environment, in my case, it's a, an AWS production server uh, service that I don't want uh, to be accessed for my day-to-day -day world. If I'm going to click that, and this is on the Microsoft App Portal, uh, then Zero Trust and Azure Conditional Access will kick in uh, and will block me from accessing this uh, service from my day-to-day -day OS. 
tells me you cannot access this right now, you're accessing it from the wrong OS. But we go further than that and we automatically redirect this request to the uh, high solid zone. I don't need to touch anything. Just detect that and then logs in to the same application from the sensitive zone where you're permitted to do that kind of access. So for example, the AWS console here is rendered from the virtual machine and cannot be rendered from uh, the host OS, cannot be accessed there. Um, so that's how we enforce that sensitive apps are only accessed from isolate. But of course, on the sensitive zone, you can also prevent users from browsing to risky websites, like in this case, Spotify is considered risky and it's being blocked on the sensitive zone. So it's purely used just for sensitive access and nothing else uh, network-wise. Um, now, well, beyond that, you might also uh, want to copy and paste content between the two zones. So uh, in here, in my setup, I allowed copying and pasting of text uh, in both directions, but you can limit this to one direction or to whatever you'd like to have. In my case, I did a paste operation of that text into Notepad. I'm getting this prompt uh, asking me for confirmation, and then the text gets passed through. Um, but if I'm going to try to copy a file, a malicious file in this case, into the high solid environment, uh, this is not allowed by my policy, so it's going to be blocked uh, by high solid. I'm copying this keylogger uh, and pressing Control V in the high solid zone. And then this is blocked by isolate and it's not allowed. So I can't introduce those malicious files into this environment. Um, so this is kind of the clipboard controls in place, preventing data leakage and introduction of malware inside the VM. But if my host OS is compromised uh, with a keylogger in this case, a very visible keylogger, um, that keylogger can run in the host OS. It can actually capture my keystrokes uh, in the host OS. So whatever I'm typing here is being recorded. But when I'm going to switch into the sensitive world and I'm going to type something into this AWS console or into Notepad, whatever sensitive content or passwords I'm going to type, uh, all of this, these keystrokes are invisible to the keylogger in the host uh, by isolate uh, in our anti-keystroke uh, logging um, feature. So it only records the primary environment and nothing of the uh, sensitive environment. Same goes for screenshots and uh, this encryption that we put in place in other aspects. Now, I mentioned that the guest OS is hardened. So for example, you cannot run uh, this uh, any kind of application as administrator. If you're going to try that. You're not going to get the permission to elevate. So this is a hardened OS uh, by default, uh, and then uh, prevents malware that you find the way to get in from persisting in that OS and getting installed. Um, finally, after a few minutes of not using the, the virtual machine, I would say I stepped away and a family member comes in and wants to uh, access this sensitive data by mistake. Um, when they try to switch into isolate, uh, they're going to get a pin code because uh, I was timed out. Uh, and this is another authentication phase before I gain access uh, to the virtual machine. Um, so another protection of the sensitive zone. Um, to finish this off, uh, this user demo, uh, any data I save, I save inside the virtual machine, any sensitive data, is of course separate from the day-to-day uh, -day uh, file system and disk. It's in its own um, encrypted virtual disk uh, encrypted by BitLocker. So you can see that I downloaded some file here and it's stored in this uh, dedicated workspace downloads folder, which is in its uh, own separate virtual disk and not accessible to the host OS uh, external to this. So that's kind of giving you a tour of the endpoint side of Isolate. Uh, in a very turbo uh, fast uh, demo. And I also want to show you uh, how the uh, management console looks like and the backend side of Isolate uh, looks like for the administrators. So I'm going to uh, log in into uh, a demo console uh, that presents this manageability in action. So of course, you have the normal dashboard showing you uh, your fleet of endpoints uh, that have Isolate installed and the activity of users potentially, uh, you know, transfer that they do across the zones and so on. Uh, and of course, you can uh, drill into the specific users uh, and even remotely wipe uh, users that uh, you know uh, have left the company or are potential uh, in the watch list or insiders. Um, but beyond just, of course, viewing your users, the main key part is uh, the policies that we put into place. And every aspect of the platform that I've shown here is configured from that central uh, management console, uh, cloud-based console. So for example, clipboard controls uh, are um, have fine-grained options here, like permitting transfers in each direction uh, for files or text or images, 
whether you require approval, whether you, whether you audit that, whether you limit the size of each transfer uh, per direction. That's an example of a policy here. Um, peripherals like USB devices, printers, and so on are also controlled centrally here. Um, you can control the network access of the VM, where you basically can limit the VM to just see a VPN gateway or web proxy or what have you, uh, so that it doesn't have free access to the internet. Um, you can add a watermark, as I've shown before, uh, or prevent screen captures um, and prevent elevated credentials and some of the elements I've shown you in the demo. And on top of this, you can deploy applications into the virtual machine, as I've shown in the demo, where you can put specific VPN clients or a Chrome browser or what have you, and just drag and drop an MSI, and it will be deployed in the virtual machine. Of course, this is all uh, an enterprise-grade console with uh, full SAML, uh, a single sign-on that you would expect, uh, assignment of policies to groups of users, and everything you would expect out of this uh, management console. So this is kind of to give you uh, this quick tour of uh, Isolate uh, in action. Um, and going back to the slide, um, what we offer with Isolate is basically, uh, just uh, skipping to the next one, is this comprehensive protection of uh, everything related to the endpoint and that's the various exfiltration channels um, of data and uh, compromise of endpoints. So by design, we create this dedicated virtual zone uh, that contains every type of sensitive data that you gain access to. Um, it is running locally, so it's cost effective and scalable. Uh, doesn't require any expensive data center or cloud costs to spin up virtual machines uh, if you're going with a BDI kind of path. Um, and the user experience is always local uh, using the hardware they already have. So it's a great experience for users that doesn't depend on latency or bandwidth. Uh, it works with any Windows app, not just the browser, not just with the specific uh, you know, apps that are supported. Anything that works on Windows will run in this virtualized environment. And doesn't require any data classification or labeling. Uh, it's a tedious process. Um, working uh, to protect you against both malware and insider threats uh, that might emerge in your organization. So this has been a quick tour of uh, the endpoint risks, the common approaches, and uh, the high solid approach for protecting uh, sensitive data and apps. Um, and by the way, going back into our survey and uh, the poll on uh, how you secure uh, sensitive data and apps. So the majority of you uh, mentioned endpoint hardening and restrictions as a way to uh, prevent leakage of data out of the endpoint. And definitely things we're seeing as well out there in the field. Um, as long as uh, uh, the, the pitfall that I mentioned, uh, which make uh, life sometimes miserable to some of the users out there, uh, but definitely makes sense. And thanks for everybody who casted their uh, votes. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, bring it back to uh, Cody for uh, Q&A, uh, to any questions from the audience. Hi, yeah, so we've gotten just a couple questions, but I do want to remind the audience that while we are here, please send in your questions because we have um, we got plenty of time to get around to them. Our first one today is, what are the minimal hardware requirements for Hisolate? Thanks, Cody. Yes, yeah, so uh, the minimal hardware requirements are uh, 8 gigabytes of RAM, uh, SSD drive, um, and any kind of modern CPU from the last... Uh, let's say five years, like Intel Core i5 or greater than that. Um, also working on a Mac product that will be ready uh, early uh, Q1. Uh, but for now, we support Windows 10 or Windows 11, uh, any uh, version that you have. Uh, so practically in most enterprise environments, this should cover uh, most of your uh, knowledge workers, sensitive workers uh, running Windows. Uh, so uh, that's that. All right, and our next question reads, uh, can Hisolate be deployed on vendor laptops? Great question. So yes, um, while I focused on corporate endpoints in this presentation, talking about how you can protect sensitive data on enterprise corporate uh, managed endpoints, uh, a very typical and uh, even hot uh, use case for Hisolate is how we can allow third parties, vendors, partners, uh, access sensitive data on their third-party managed endpoints. So uh, definitely, this is a great alternative to other solutions 
because uh, it's really the threat there is even greater than your own employees. This is their own endpoint, their own turf, and the ability to spin up this virtual machine on their endpoint uh, without invading their privacy and their own endpoint tools. So spinning up this virtual zone where you have control and you can make sure that sensitive access is done only from that environment is a great use case for isolate. So definitely. Excellent. Our next question reads, uh, how does Isolate integrate with zero trust solutions? Right. So um, we support a variety of the, the most popular uh, zero trust solutions out there uh, with Isolate uh, to ensure that you can force users to only use the virtual machine for accessing sensitive content and not rely on their goodwill uh, to switch into that environment. Uh, for example, with Azure AD conditional access, which is a very popular zero trust uh, vendor uh, by Microsoft, um, basically, you would set up rules saying you can only access, uh, let's say, those specific sensitive apps that you already have uh, in the Azure portal, in the Microsoft Applications portal, um, based on the attributes that Isolate provides, like secrets uh, that determine that the traffic is coming from a Isolate VM. And this is a blueprint we have in place and implemented in other places as well. So uh, Azure AD, conditional access, Zscaler, uh, those types of solutions are uh, easily uh, integrated with Hisley. Excellent. Um, we got one more question right here so far. And it reads, what kind of training, if any, is needed to help remote and hybrid users get up to speed to use Hisley? Excellent question. So. Unfortunately, because this solution is, uh, is similar to uh, elements of uh, UI that users already know and use for a long time, like uh, those multiple spaces on Mac or on Windows, uh, users find it uh, familiar and easy to use uh, very quickly. Uh, to add to that, the fact that we have the automatic redirection feature that puts people in the right zone if they get confused. And we found that uh, people uh, and employees are uh, easily um, using Isolate. Um, we actually also have a free product to isolate and we see uh, users uh, going into that and starting to use isolate without any training whatsoever. Uh, so definitely uh, this is something that uh, you should try and, and see for yourself. It's uh, easy to get started, easy onboarding. We make it consumer grade uh, onboarding for user with this little guide that I've shown in the demo. So uh, super easy to get started. Excellent. Well, Tal, that seems to be all the questions that we've received so far. Um, did, was there anything that you wanted to include as maybe a final note before we close out? Uh, last thing, yeah, I'll just uh, uh, mention again for everybody that uh, you can try this for yourself uh, with our free offering, um, isolate.com, uh, where you can download Isolate, uh, use it free forever. It's not something which is kind of a, a time-limited trial. Um, we love to have uh, users using this for their own uh, sake uh, forever. Uh, as long as it's for standalone use, there's no charge. We uh, get paid by the enterprise version uh, for enterprise that deploy this worldwide uh, for their employees. Um, so feel free to try it out uh, and uh, reach out to us if you have any questions or if you want uh, help getting started. Uh, and thanks for listening in. Well, perfect. Well, Tal, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and for preparing your demo. Um, any questions that we weren't that will come in over the next few minutes, um, we'll go ahead and get those sent over to Hisolate, and they can respond to those after the webinar concludes. Um, a quick reminder that today's session was recorded. So following this webinar, you'll receive an email with a link to access the recording on demand. You can also find the recording on the Security Boulevard website. Just visit securityboulevard.com slash webinars and look in the on-demand section. Now on to the four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing. Our first winner is Morkel T. Our second winner is Anushka S. Our third winner is Vulcan B. And our fourth winner is Troy R. Congratulations to the four of you. Please keep an eye on your inbox to claim your gift card. If you don't receive an email, check your spam folder. Um, Tal, thank you so much for putting this together. And I'd also like to thank you, our audience, for being with us for the entirety of today's presentation. This is Cody J. Brown signing off. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.